Good morning, friends, and welcome here to St. Helens as we celebrate one of the great feasts of the church, the Feast of Christ the King. If you're able, please would you stand as we sing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. one Lord and King of all the world. There is apparently, however, two versions for that hymn. Um, we're fortunate that we can rely on Christ, even if we can't rely on your devoted parish vicar getting the right words for him. Friends, we meet in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord Jesus sits enthroned as King forevermore. He shall give strength to his people. He shall, he shall give, give his, his people the blessing of peace. So the Lord be with you. And the Lord be with you. If you'd like to be seated. Welcome indeed this morning as we celebrate the Feast of Christ the King. Uh, today is the final week of the church's year. Next week we step into Advent. And I love the way the church has kind of put this together. You see, Advent is about preparing and remembering the fact Jesus has come and will come again. We finish the church year today with Jesus being the king of all creation to remind us that all time fits within his power, within his plan. And so as we sit beneath the God and king who loves us, whatever's going on in our lives can be found rest in him. So we turn to our confession now and you are going to re recognise these words. But they are so deeply true. Life, joy, hope and healing are found in knowing the Lord Jesus and following his teaching. Yet too often we stray from his way and we exchange the worship of the true God for following the way of the world. So let us remind ourselves of his way, which brings true freedom. Because our King, the Lord Jesus Christ, said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. 
The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than this. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord have mercy. So hear the call of Jesus Christ the King. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So indeed, let us turn away from sin. Let us turn to the Lord. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith. Let us pray. O King enthroned on high, filling the earth with your glory, holy is your name, Lord God Almighty. In our sinfulness we cry to you to take our guilt away and to cleanse our lips to speak your word. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. To Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive us our sins, open our eyes to God's truth, strengthen us to do God's will, and give us the joy of his kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We stand for the glory. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his sweet on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, to see my prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit. In the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray together the words of the collect. God the Father, help us to hear the call of Christ the King and to follow in his service, whose kingdom has no end. For he reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, one glory. Amen. Friends, if you'd like to be seated for our readings. Our reading will be found on the service sheets, the order of service readings that have got the picture of Jesus uh, on the back. And the first reading comes from Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 to 14. And just by way of a, a brief word or two of introduction, this uh, picture, this uh, vision of Daniel is one of the key uh, visions where the Israelites, the, the Jewish people, even before Jesus came, understood that there was going to be somebody coming who was God and who is God. And that's how they recognised, part of how they recognised who Jesus is and was. So here it is, Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 to 14. As I, that's Daniel, looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed, and given over to be burned with fire. But their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and was present, uh, presented before him. And to him was given dominion, and glory, 
and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall be not be destroyed. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. And as I read it here, that phrase that comes back again, coming with the clouds. The, the writer John is, is joining dots here to help us see who Jesus is. So here we go, Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before we hear from our gospel this morning, we stand to sing that great hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns.
This morning the Gospel reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 33 to 37. So hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray to you now and we ask that as we explore these readings, that we would indeed hear your truth, grow in faith, grow in love and obedience, that we may know freedom and your presence. Amen. If you'd like to be seated, friends. <coughs> this morning, I want to explore with you uh, Revelation, that second of our readings. And before I dive in, I want to just sort of lay out to you, or ask you, I guess. When you hear the word king, what do you think? It's a little bit easier now that we have a king again, but... Do you think of somebody who is a little bit like our monarch, the king, who has all the trappings of wealth, uh, the palaces, the, uh, the entourage, the bodyguards, but actually, with all due respect to his majesty, his life, the role of our monarchy, has been basically reduced to signing the acts that come into parliament. And so basically, in theory, in our system, we can decide amongst ourselves what we want to happen. We then tell our MP, if enough people around the country are agreeing, the MPs will then debate it in Parliament. And then if they're debating it in Parliament, and it passes, it then goes to the House of Lords. And if the House of Lords uh, agree, and they've debated it, and if we've kind of, it's come from the grassroots, it's hard for them to say no, it gets passed then, and then it ends up on his majesty's desk. Don't worry, the constitutional lesson will end in a moment. Uh, the, basically what happens is, we begin, in theory, now I know for those of you that are eternal optimists and cynics rolled into one, you go, doesn't matter how I vote, it all stays the same. That might be true, but in theory, if we at a grassroots level want to have something happen, we get on to our MP, who gets onto the Parliament, who gets onto the House of Lords, who then gets to the King, and the King basically goes, well, right, and signs it off. And so our King, effectively, God bless and rest him, is ultimately a figurehead. He's somebody that basically stops somebody else taking the power. In some senses, he is basically window dressing. Be very careful, I don't get a knock on the door from the king who turns out that I'm wrong. Um, do you think of a king in those terms? Basically, nice fluff that gives us a coronation once every couple of decades. Kind of useless. Kind of, we're above him even though we're below him. Or do you think of a king more like his namesake, Charles I, who pushed his weight around, or even worse, King John of history. We move from constitution to history now, by the way, if you haven't realised. But like, uh, the, you know, the robber barons, somebody that, that, that taxed us and didn't listen to us and hated, ultimately, we were useful only insofar as he had power over us. No care, just wealth and power. 
My guess is that when you hear the word king, you're somewhere in one of those spaces. And so when I say to you this morning, Christ the king, what you're doing is you are fitting Jesus into the sort of the old monarch who basically just signs stuff and looks pretty. I don't think King Charles ever been called pretty before. Um, or do you think of him as kind of like a despot from a film? Because the reality is that if you think either of these things, your spiritual life is going to be all skew with, and you're going to miss out on the wonder and the reality of who Jesus is. If you take models of kingship you see in the world, and then say, Jesus has got to be one of these, you're going to miss it. But instead, if you listen to how he says he's a king, it should light you up with enthusiasm to the reality of what is possible in the world. And so, with that very long intro, who is Jesus in terms of his kingship? Because, as well, the thing is, I tend to, if I'm frank, most of us have one dominant image of Jesus in our mind. For me, I think of him as the saviour who's healed me and who guides me. But he's my king. His guidance is not optional. And if we look in verse 5 of the reading, we're, we're in the text now. The introduction moving in. Look at his described. He's the firstborn of the dead, which means he's the one who's inherited um, life beyond death. The first one really to do it. And it says here he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. And what that means is that every government in this world sits under the government of Jesus. Every ruler, everybody, it doesn't matter how much pomp and ceremony that you think that they've had, whether you think of the golden chariots at the, uh, the, conf uh, at the, uh, the state carriage, or whether you think of these empires that have spanned continents, all of these kings and the President of the United States, and uh, the European Union, Putin, all of these people who notionally have power, sit under Jesus. And this is really important, because in sitting under Jesus, we see that who we follow is not ultimately a political party. Who we vote for is important, but who we follow our hope is not in an MP, is not in a king, a prince, a new president. Our hope is in the king of kings, who is, in that beautiful phrase, the potentate of time, the person who kicked time into motion. He's the person we follow through time. But that creates, if we're frank, a little bit of an awkward moment. Because I don't know about you, but when I think of Putin, I don't think, oh yeah, he's following Jesus. When I think of um, other leaders around the world, I don't think, oh yeah, clearly following Jesus. When I think of our own MPs, in fact, a lot of them, I don't go, yeah, they clearly turn up to church and love Jesus. I don't. Many of the laws that we have, are they not made listening to Jesus? They're made listening to power and policy. So what do we do as Christians? If we're being called to connect with Jesus, and follow him, and we have laws in our country that split us off from him, what do we do? You can have a pretty easy guess, right? If you are in the military and you're given, actually, at the risk of, we'll make this interactive, right, can policemen enforce laws that aren't legal? Okay, there you go. There's the fascinating thing. He wasn't expecting to get tested three weeks into the job in the middle of his sermon. But Riley, basically, uh, he, he, absolutely, I didn't actually know the answer to it, so I was checking before, I, you know. Uh, I don't mind giving bad culinary advice out, but giving out bad legal advice from the pulpit would be a step too far. Um, but the reality is that a, a policeman can enforce a law in this country that's legal, but disconnects us with Jesus. And so we have a choice. And the early church actually had this choice. They were told that they had to uh, sacrifice incense to the emperor. They had to worship the emperor. And Christians simply went, no, not happening. I'll be dead before I do that. And the emperor took them up on the offer and killed them. So there are times 
when actually the law of the land can be enforced upon us and as Christians we say not happening over my dead body I will go to prison or worse before I follow this now this isn't a general excuse for you to send a, um, uh, an email to Brighton when you get your next parking ticket and say Jesus didn't hand out the parking tickets when parking where I like thank you very much right it's about the things that split us from what Jesus has said and that actually has cost people their lives even today there are people in prison in North Korea in China in parts of Africa in the Islamic world who have found Jesus know Jesus have met him and said you know what I can't follow that law I can't anymore turn up to mosque and to, to make the prayers to Allah because Allah is not Jesus Allah is not God and they cost, and it costs. So, here we go. For those of you that came this morning looking for something to pep you up and a bit of encouragement, so glad you came, I know. But here it is. Here's the pivot, and this is why it's brilliant. Why is it that Christians all over the world are content to go to prison and content ultimately to die when there's the disconnect? Why do they feel comfortable with it? And that comes in the rest of verse 5 and 6. And this is just so phenomenally exciting. You see, if you think of a king as being somebody who's basically going to judge you, whack you, and drill you down, you're not going to come to Jesus as a king. But look at how his kingship is described here. The first words out of the mouth. The king of the, all, of the ruler of all the kings of the earth, what does he do, first of all? He loves us. He loves you. For him, the king of all creation, the potentate of time, looks at you and his dominant emotion is love. His dominant emotion is love. And that is the overflow of the love of the Father. That's God himself loving you. I don't know whether you've ever been to one of those sort of royal walkbys where, where our monarchy or members of the royal family go and visit a town. Um, but one of the things you notice is that they'll walk and they'll pause for a moment and they'll move on to the next person. And we love it because they've got a common touch. That's the theory. Well, Jesus, who loves us, didn't pause for a moment, but became flesh, and this is how much he loved us. He didn't pause and ask us how our day is going. Look at the next thing. He freed us from our sins by his blood. The king of all creation died for you. Incidentally, that's one of the reasons I'm wearing red today. To remind us that the king's life was given for you. He loves us. And so, if the whole of our laws in this country start telling me I can't be a Christian, the laws of this country haven't died for me. The laws of this country haven't offered me an eternal life. <clears throat> Who in the right mind trades down? If you've got a car on your front drive and somebody offers to trade you for a bicycle, your first thought is, brilliant, I've always, I've always liked cycling. Your first thought is, jog on. Not happening. And so it is. If the king of all creation loves you and has died for you, if his majesty decides to sign things into law that mean I can't follow Jesus, you're going to be visiting me at his majesty's pleasure. Because it'll be worth it. And I hope, by the way, that you'll be joining me. We'll be on cell block B together. It'll be great, we'll have a prayer meeting. We'll do this, it'll be lovely. <laughs> but, but the reality is, actually, when you look at the accounts of Christians in prison, they talk about the presence of God there in wonderful ways. It will be, and it is lovely. But it keeps going, it keeps getting better, because he doesn't just love us and save us, he gives us an identity. He makes us a kingdom. And as a kingdom, he makes us, look at that in verse 6, a kingdom of priests. I've said this to you a number of times. But for me, one of the sad realities of how language has shifted over time is that you all look at me as a priest with the word priest. You know, it's sort of, uh, my technical job title, by the way, is a clerk in holy orders, as, as fancy as that is. And it's good to remember that, because 
What Jesus is saying here through John is that each and every one of us who are baptised are priests. We've been anointed. That's why it's exciting when baptisms come out, because we're adding to the number of the church family who have the role of priests. But the beautiful thing is this, that you don't actually have to be baptised to sort of get your training wheels as a priest. You can start acting as a faithful priest even before you're baptised. And you might say, how is that? How is it? Out of interest, what do you think a priest does? There's no daft answers. Listens. Pardon? Listens. Listens, yeah, absolutely. So one of the things a priest does primarily is listens. Listens to who? Everyone. Everyone, yeah. Listens to people. Listens to folks. And then who else do they listen to? God, bingo. The primary role of the priest, basically, is, if you imagine the world, we're in, in church we kind, of, we kind of have this set up. People are here. The priest is here. Right? And where do we have a cross? Here. The image of what we're doing shows what a priest does on a daily basis. That a priest looks at the world looks at Jesus and says, how do I connect with them? How do I connect with them? And the reason that I'm called a priest on a Sunday morning is because I, I have the, the privilege of overseeing the kingdom of priests. There's a reason that the Eucharistic prayer, I say it, but what do you all do? You all say, Amen. Because if I was to pray the prayers here and you all went beggar off, it wouldn't work. I'm not sure I can say that soon. I just have. If you were to do that, it would all break down because we together celebrate what Jesus has done. Does this make sense? And so on a, on a daily basis, not just on a Sunday, you are a priest with the privilege and the passion and the power to be able to pray for people, listen to what God says and connect people to him. Listen to what people say and connect them to God. You do not have to be here on a Sunday morning to function as a priest. You should be here. God calls you to be here. But the Sunday morning is where we come together and we celebrate. Through the week, we're given this wonderful identity, this wonderful possibility of seeing lives changed through our prayers. And the great thing about it is as well, you don't need a theology degree, you don't need to be a certain age. For the youngest folk in the room here this morning, that's you as well. Seriously, it is. You have the possibility of listening to God and praying for your friends. And I promise you that as you do it, as we walk with Jesus, we see him do wonderful things. So today, as I come into land, I hope you understand a little bit of why I'm excited about Christ the King. Because the king of all creation, who guides us to live, doesn't keep at us a distance, but draws us close. And in drawing us close, gives us the responsibility, the privilege, of drawing other people close. If you go abroad and you have your passport robbed, where do you go? You go to the embassy, the representative of his majesty's government in, wherever it is, Berlin or Paris. So too, as priests, you have the possibility and the privilege of effectively being embassies for Jesus in your communities, in your schools, in your homes, so that people are able to come to you and go, can you just pray for me? And for those of you that get worried about the idea of praying aloud with people, you can still say, yeah, no worries, I'll pray, absolutely, and choose to pray when you go home. The king is involved in our lives. The king loves us and he frees us. And in freeing us, gives us the opportunity to help others become free. I'd be more excited than that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, our heavenly king, we thank you. We thank you so, so much that you have saved us, freed us from our sin, that you have loved us with the love of the Father, and that you have offered to us a life 
where we can see that love become a reality in other people. We ask this morning that you would stir us up to follow you. We ask that you give us courage to follow you above the laws of this land, if the laws of this land seek to draw us from you. We ask you to give us courage in our families, in our work, in our school, to follow you if the things going on around us are damaging other people and separating them from you. Be glorified, we pray. May we see your kingdom come and your will be done in our lives and the lives of those around us. Amen. Before we to continue praying, we're going to uh, affirm our faith. Uh, I think this might be the first time that I've used this one in our, our gathering together. So a little bit of a caveat before we say it. Um, the church has three creeds. The Nicene, the Apostle, and the Athanasian Creed. The Athanasian Creed is epic. It goes on for ages. But it also has little short statements, most of which come from Scripture, that allow us to use the words of the Bible to affirm our faith. This one comes from uh, Philippians and uh, speaks of the character and the reality of Jesus both being God but also stooping down for our benefit. So just let us stand. Let's have a moment just to cast our eye over it. So let us affirm our faith in Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the only Son of God. Though he was divine, he did not cling to equality of God, but made his son nothing. Taking the form of a slave, he was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has raised him on high and given him the name of every and the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every voice proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen. Confident of him being precisely that, let us sit or kneel as we pray in the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ our King. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I pray, we pray for our brothers and sisters here gathered, the members of the church family who can't be with us this morning. And Father, we pray that by your Spirit you would guide us into um, Father, into an ever-increasing joy of each of us exercising the ministry of priesthood, of listening to people, listening to God, and praying that we would see your kingdom come. Father, we thank you for this call, and we pray by Jesus' name that you would help us grow in it. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Father, we pray for those who have been ordained within the church to oversee the household of faith, to oversee the priesthood of all believers. We pray for those whom we call uh, priests and deacons, but also for our bishops. Father, we pray that they would be faithful to your word courageous in following you. Father, that they would not listen to the pressures of the world, but speak boldly truth and hope that people's lives may be transformed. Father, we pray particularly for those bishops, priests and deacons who strayed from your way, those who move from being faithful under-shepherds to being wolves preying on the sheep. 
Father, we pray that you protect the people of God from them. That you'd call them to repentance or remove them from the church. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Father, we pray now for those who are sick, for those who are struggling in mind, in body and spirit. Father, we pray for healing. We pray for hope. We pray for transformation. Father, we pray particularly for those who are struggling with long-term illness. Father, may you be present to them and may you bring healing according to your will. Lord, hear us. And finally, Father, we pray for the government of this land. We pray for His Majesty the King, His Majesty's government and most loyal opposition. Father, we pray that there would be a resurgence of faithfulness within our Parliament and the House of Lords. We pray that rules that draw people away from you, Father, we pray that they would be repealed and replaced. Father, we pray. Father, we pray particularly for the assisted dying bill. Father, we know that it's rooted in a heart for compassion and yet will bring misery and separate people from dependence on you. And so, Father, we pray that it is defeated, but we also pray that you would raise up Christians to work in hospitals and hospices, that those who suffer and are near end of death would be given comfort, would be given dignity and care. Lord, hear us. Lord, gracious, hear us. Heavenly Father, you have delivered us from the power of darkness. You brought us into the kingdom of your Son. Grant that as his death has recalled us to life, so his continual presence in us may raise us to eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. One of the other parts of uh, the beauty of being made into a kingdom is that we're not simply a kingdom of strangers, but we are a kingdom made up of a rich family. Jesus brings us together as one because of what he's done. So if you're able, please understand as we come to the meeting. To crown all things, there must be love. To bind all together and complete the whole. So let the peace of Jesus Christ our King rule in our hearts. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of Jesus' peace. <laughs> I normally wear a video, so I thought I could give you a proper piece today. <laughs> After the resounding success of the first hymn, the Chapel of Wrong Words, uh, I thought, why not? Let's introduce a hymn we've not sung. Um, so our next hymn, I'm pretty certain, is new, uh, is new to us as a church family. Uh, if you watch Songs of Praise, you may uh, already know it. Uh, it's King of Kings, Majesty.
for these gifts, for those given in other ways. May they be given to sharing your good news in Jesus' name. Amen. We're on page seven. Blessed be God who enthrones us with Christ in the heavenly realms. May we feed upon the bread of God and drink the royal wine of heaven. <coughs> Blessed be God forever. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. So lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy always and everywhere to give you thanks, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God. For with the oil of gladness you have anointed Christ the Lord, your only Son, to be our great High Priest and King of all creation. As priest he offered himself once for all upon the altar of the cross, and redeemed the human race by this perfect sacrifice of peace. As king, he claims dominion over all creatures, that he may bring before your infinite majesty a kingdom of truth and life, a kingdom of holiness and grace, a kingdom of justice, love and peace. And so with angels and archangels and all the heavenly hosts, we proclaim your glory and join their unending hymn of praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. If you'd like to sit or kneel as we continue to pray. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He gave it to his disciples saying, 
take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption as we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom, all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we, in the company of all the saints, may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father. Amen. So let us with confidence, as the King of Kings has taught us, pray to our Heavenly Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us peace. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. Most merciful Lord, your love compels us to come in. Our hands are unclean, our hearts are unprepared. We were not fit even to eat the crumbs from under your table. But you, Lord, are the God of our salvation, and share your bread with sins. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and the blood of your Son, that he may live in us and we in him, and that we, with the whole company of Christ, may sit and eat in your kingdom. So friends, I invite you to come forward. If you are baptised and an adult, you're welcome to come receive these gifts of Jesus' body and his blood. If you're on the journey to faith, or if you're of slightly younger years, the Lord Jesus loves you and calls you too. And so it's my pleasure to be able to pray his prayer a blessing over you. Can I invite you to come forward? Thank you.
Stir up, O Lord, the wills of your faithful people, that they plenteously bring it forth the fruit of good works, may by you be plenteously rewarded. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work in your praise and glory. Amen. Just a couple of notices uh, this morning. Um, one of it is that for those of you that are old school that can remember the prayer book, you'll know that uh, this Sunday morning used to be traditionally called Stir Up Sunday. Um, Stir Up Sunday was um, you're going to have to forgive me. You can back with me. Uh, it was when the Christmas cakes were starting to be made and that kind of stuff. People's minds really did begin to get into the Advent swing. But the reason that it was called Stir Up Sunday was after the prayer we just prayed, Stir Up, O Lord. And it's a brilliant prayer. On the back of your notice sheet, you're going to see two prayers underneath the picture of Jesus in stained glass. The first one is um, the, the collect for this morning, if memory serves me correctly. And the second one is that Stir Up prayer. Yes, it is. Um, the reality is that in the Christian life, we can get distracted when we have algorithms that are dictating what we look at online all the time, and we have uh, all of the, the pressures of school, or we have the pressures of work and all that kind of stuff, the reality is that we can become distracted from the core realities of our life. That Jesus is on the throne. However bad this week gets, he hasn't resigned, he hasn't stepped down. He's there and calls us to live a life marked by that. The prayer to be stirred up is asking God to help us to live beyond the life we can in our own power, but one that is a gift to us if we would like it. So I'd encourage you through, uh, perhaps through Advent, to wherever this can kind of live helpfully in your house, stick it on your fridge, stick a magnet just above the crown, or um, pin it to somewhere, um, or perhaps slot it inside of your Bible, and, and pray these prayers. Um, so often we as Christians live below the life that he has for us because we get distracted. Um, Jesus, the King of Kings, <coughs> Jesus, invites us to an adventure, frankly. And it's an adventure that um, is, is one that blesses us and those around us. So be stirred up this Advent as we come into Christmas. Let's not do Advent like the thing that we do every year. Uh, but instead, let us keep a heart and mind on living in the presence of the resurrected Jesus. That's an encouragement. We're going to pivot now to uh, a slightly less encouraging moment. Uh, for those of you that were here uh, last week, uh, you'll have noticed that we are this morning one Archdeacon Light. Um, and so I want to take a moment to pray for him. Uh, he's had to go to another parish this morning. Uh, a priest that's no longer a priest in uh, ministering uh, this past week has just been given uh, life imprisonment for uh, unspeakable things. I'll just put it that way, given who's in the room. And so he's, as far as I understand, the guy's not been in ministry for quite a while. Um, but the Archdeacon's gone to be with the church that he was ministering at at the time uh, to care for them and to comfort them and actually uh, to point them, towards, um, point them towards Jesus. Because the bottom line is that people that claim the name of Christ, people that uh, wear a dog collar or the, the robes of the church or all that kind of stuff, are capable of straying and capable of darkness. That grieves me that it's true. And so that's uh, why he's not here. God willing, he's going to be here in a few weeks' time. But I'd just like to, um, you know, the bottom line is, in parts of the world, the Christians are in prison for following Jesus and loving people. In this country, occasionally, for instance, prison because they ignore Jesus. And the impact that it has on people is huge. So can we just take a moment to pray for that church and for our archdeacon and for those that have struggled?
Heavenly Father, we pray for those who have been at the hands of darkness, at the hands of somebody who's claimed uh, to be a person of light and yet dealt in darkness. Father, we pray for those that are struggling and suffering with the after effects of that. And we pray that Jesus, by his spirit, will come and bring healing and comfort. We pray for the church community at wide. Father, that they would not lose hope and faith in Jesus. And for the archdeacon, as about now he has conversations of, of difficult, uh, difficult conversations, we pray that you would give him wisdom, that his words would be salted with truth, love, care and sympathy, that his presence there would be a balm amidst the pain. Father, we pray too for him that um, you would sustain him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, beyond that, um, beyond that very important but sad notice, it just remains to say that we do have our four o'clock service this evening in the historic church. Advent starts uh, on Sunday, so um, we're getting very close to me being able to wish you a happy new year. Um, enjoy the rest of the year, all six days of it that are left. Let us stand for the blessing. Christ, our exalted King, pour upon you his abundant gifts and bring you to reign with him in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Ultimately, our hope is not in the princes of man or in church leaders, but in Christ alone. And so we sing to our exalted King, in Christ alone my hope is found. Yeah.